Hello and welcome to the community outreach meeting for the Long Bar Restoration Project. In the past, these meetings have been held in purpose and they served the goal of providing an opportunity for the community to engage with the restoration project and those entities undertaking the restoration. However, for potentially obvious COVID-19 related reasons, an in-person meeting isn't possible and so this video will serve that purpose. The goals of this video are the same as the meetings. We're going to provide a bit of historic context for the need for restoration at Long Bar. We're going to introduce the funding mechanism, and we're going to talk about the project more specifically, including monitoring, project design, and permitting. For questions, comments, or other feedback, please email us at yubarestorationproject at yubariver.org. The email address you can see on this slide. We will be responding to comments, questions, and your feedback until Friday, July 31st, 2020. This video will begin with an introduction to the South Yuba River Citizens League. We'll provide some historical context, a bit of a project overview. I'll talk a little bit about the Anadromous Fish Restoration Program, which is the funding mechanism and river restoration more generally. Afterwards, we'll hear from Avery at Kramer Fish Sciences, who will talk about monitoring and permitting associated with the project. After that, Sam from Seabeck Eco Engineering will discuss project design. At the end, I will go over the details for how to provide feedback or ask questions. My name is Aaron Zettler-Mann, and I'm in charge of river restoration on the Lower Yuba River for the South Yuba River Citizens League. Hi, I'm Melinda Booth. I serve as the Executive Director for the South Yuba River Citizens League, affectionately referred to by our acronym, CIRCLE. Thanks for joining us for this virtual town hall meeting. I'd like to take a couple of minutes and give you a background about CIRCLE. Founded in 1983, CIRCLE unites the community to protect and restore the Yuba River watershed with more than 36 years of achievements, 3,500 members, and 1,300 active volunteers, Circle is doing great things for the Yuba watershed. We're working to restore wild salmon to their native waters and inspiring activism across the globe with our environmental film festival. We're revitalizing mountain meadows and helping create healthier and more resilient forests in the face of climate change. We work locally and in Sacramento, advocating for the health of our local natural treasures we monitor water quality, educate youth, and clean up the river. From the summit to the sea, we engage in issues that impact our backyard here in the Yuba. You're watching to learn a little bit more about a restoration project in the Lower Yuba River aimed at creating spawning and rearing habitat for Chinook salmon. I'll leave the details to the experts you'll hear from next, but I want to thank you for your participation and for engaging in what's happening in your community. The Yuba River is located in Northern California. Like many rivers which drain into California's Central Valley, populations of native Chinook salmon and steelhead in the Yuba River have declined dramatically since European settlement of the area. Historically, the Yuba River supported large numbers of spring and fall run Chinook salmon and steelhead. However, the fisheries suffered enormous losses as a result of the gold rush and dam construction. Since the start of the gold rush in the mid-1800s, Populations of anadromous salmonid fish in the Yuba River have been adversely affected by anthropogenic factors. These include hydraulic gold mining, channel manipulation, including dam construction, water diversion, and regulation of the flow regime. Hydraulic mining during the gold rush mobilized approximately 684 million cubic yards of mining debris, which washed into the lower Yuba River floodplain. The majority of that material remains there today. Once hydraulic mining was banned by the Sawyer decisions in 1884, the material that was washed into the floodplain was reworked. Giant dredges, like those seen here, dug up the recently deposited material as well as the existing floodplain. Within these floating houses, the excavated material was sorted for gold and then deposited in huge piles of alluvial gravels. The piles that we see today in the Yuba gold fields. In 1941, Inglebright Dam was constructed in the lower Yuba River without fish passage. In addition, the reservoir alters the temperature 
and flow regime for the lower Yuba River. Because it doesn't have fish passage, it cuts off approximately 95% of historic spawning and rearing habitat in the Yuba River watershed. This degradation has reduced temperature and food complexity, overall productivity within the lower Yuba River, and has aided in the success of numerous competitive and predatory aquatic species. It has been estimated that about 2 million fall run Chinook salmon returned annually to Central Valley rivers and streams prior to the gold rush, of which about 15% or up to 300,000 fish returned to the Yuba River specifically. However, over the last 30 years, an average of only 15,000 fall run Chinook salmon have returned to the Yuba River to spawn. And between 2015 and 2019, the average return numbers have fallen further to approximately 3,800. This represents a significant decrease in the annual salmonid returns to the Yuba River. The Long Bar Restoration Project is funded by the Anadromous Fish Restoration Program, or AFRP, which is part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, housed in the Department of the Interior. The goal of the AFRP is to make, quote, all reasonable efforts to at least double natural production of anadromous fish in California's Central Valley streams on a long-term and sustainable basis. There are a number of goals of the AFRP. However, broadly speaking, the objective of the program is to increase the production of anadromous fish by improving the habitat for those species of various life stages and to make it easier for returning salmonids to reach viable spawning areas. The Long Bar Project has similar goals, to improve the physical habitat specifically for salmonids during the rearing phase of life, and to collect quantitative data that can be used to evaluate the effectiveness of this restoration project and improve future restoration projects. At Long Bar, by enhancing existing features and creating heterogeneity within the river and the floodplain, we hope to improve the physical habitat for those AFRP target species. As we fly over the Long Bar project area, looking west, we can see on our left, the Yuba gold fields. These are the large piles of floodplain gravels left over by dredge mining. As we look down at the project area specifically, we can see that it is dominated by gravels and cobbles, that is, rocks that are golf ball to basketball size. There are some native willow and other vegetation species present, but they are in low density and only offer places for salmonids to hide during the largest high water events. Most of the gravel bar is fairly flat and homogeneous in elevation. That means that there isn't much in the way of secondary channels for juvenile salmon at rearing. The vegetation that is present is generally small. There are some places in the floodplain that indicate evidence of secondary channels, but they are unshaded and do not have places for juvenile salmonids to take shelter from swift currents, to hide from predators. The vegetation coverage doesn't promote the abundant food that growing juvenile salmon need to encourage success later in life. The Long Bar Project will create approximately 50 acres of new rearing habitat for spring and fall run Chinook salmon and steelhead. This habitat will be created through direct restoration action, including lowering the floodplain and creating new back channels and alcoves, in addition to enhancing current features that exist in the project area. The restoration process at Long Bar will take two approaches, one of which is active restoration. That is, the act of removal of gravels and construction of new channel features, including backwaters and side channels, similar to that seen here at the Hallward Tiger project area. However, the Long Bar project site will be of a smaller scale than that at Hallwood. In addition to active channel construction, there will be planting of new riparian species, including willows, alders, and other vegetation, similar to that seen at the previously completed Hammond Bar project.
The Longbar Restoration Project also recognizes that the Yuba River, like most rivers, are inherently dynamic systems, and that this restoration project in some ways is simply providing the tools and supplies necessary for those natural processes to take over. Like we can see in the graphic at the top, designed for the Hallwood Tykert Restoration Project, the goals of the Long Bar Project are to lower the floodplain, increase the presence of woody and other riparian vegetation, and create side channel and backwater habitat. Once these constructed features have been made, natural processes such as erosion and deposition and the recruitment of additional wood will take over. In the next 10 to 20 years, it's possible that restoration site at Long Bar might begin to look like one of the two figures on the bottom, both of which are from the Willamette River in Oregon. Next, we're going to hear about monitoring from Avery at Kramer Fish Sciences. Thank you for watching our presentation on the Long Bar Monitoring Project. We're excited to be sharing this work with you guys. My name is Avery Shear, and I am an ecologist with Kramer Fish Sciences, who is responsible for the biological monitoring and the permitting on this project. To get started today, I just wanted to give a little introduction on why monitoring is important to perform on restoration projects. So this essentially performs two functions. First, we want to make sure that the project we are currently constructing actually uh, achieves the goals that we set out to uh, accomplish that have motivated this project. So in this case, we're trying to improve salmonid habitat, and we want to make sure we actually achieve that. In addition, we invest a lot of money in restoration projects, and so we want to make sure that we're not only doing a good job on this project, but we're taking the opportunity to learn and improve the way that we do restoration on future projects. So um, monitoring allows us to assess the assumptions that we're using when we design these habitat improvements and to learn from them so we can, uh, we can do better in the future. In order to assess the Long Bar project, we're going to be using a before-after control impact study design. And this essentially means that we will be measuring environmental conditions in the project footprint, footprint before and after the restoration project, which is fairly intuitive. But in addition, because we're working in a natural system, which is very complex, and because this project is going to extend over a, a long time, we want to make sure that we are accounting for other things like environmental variation that is going to change over the course of the study. And that could potentially result in changes at the project site that we um, don't want to attribute to the restoration. We want to make sure we're only assessing the actual impacts of the restoration. So to help control for that, we are going to measure the same environmental conditions over the same time frame at a second location outside the project footprint that will be called our control site. So this is a map of the Long Bar project site showing the different habitats, both control and restoration that we will be monitoring for the study. There are several types of habitats, both in the main channel and the backwater that we will want to monitor during the course of the project. Um, and of most interest, since this is an off-channel restoration project, are the different types of off-channel habitats. So there is an existing backwater at the project site that we are going to enhance. And in addition, we will be constructing flood, flood plain and side channel habitats as well. So we'll be monitoring those as well as a few different types of habitats in the main channel. And then we will have control habitats upstream and downstream of the project in the main channel, as well as another backwater at Hammond Bar located downstream um, that will serve as our off-channel control. So there are four different types of monitoring that go into restoration projects. Um, and this is a table of uh, each of those types, which is a lot to look at. But in terms of um, in terms of biological monitoring, we're really interested in effectiveness monitoring, which allows us to assess this actual project, as I mentioned, and determine whether or not it meets its restoration objectives. And then validation monitoring, which is more focused on that long-term improvement of restoration techniques. So that's going to allow us to assess the underlying assumptions that we use to construct the project. In addition, um, there's a third type of monitoring, pre-project monitoring, which is really important because this provides the before data of that before after control impact study design. So in order to compare conditions afterwards, we need to make sure we're collecting all of the same data currently before the project is constructed. 
And this is where we are right now, providing that baseline condition of the site. Um, this pre-project monitoring also goes into some of the permitting and compliance for the project. So we're going to be assessing whether there are special status species at the project and whether um, the work we have planned has a potential to negatively impact them, which we would not want to do. So this would allow us to mitigate for those effects and ensure we're not causing negative impacts at, at Longmore. Okay, on to the more exciting stuff, uh, what we're monitoring. Obviously, since this is a project that's targeting salmonids, salmon monitoring is going to be the most important. So we're going to be looking primarily at salmon populations using snorkel surveys, where we're actually sending people out to see um, things like abundance and density and composition of fish species at these different project sites. Um, we are, as I mentioned, currently doing uh, pre-project monitoring, and we have been conducting snorkel surveys since January of this year, and they will continue through um, next summer until we begin construction. So um, some of the pre-project data I have to show you, share with you today, um, we've been looking at densities of uh, Chinook salmon in the different habitat types that we have over uh, time as we've been sampling through the months. So you can see from this graph that we saw a peak in salmon densities in February, which is um, consistent with what we would expect for the biology of this fish. And interestingly, we are seeing individuals mostly in the main channel habitats that we're monitoring, which makes sense. The underlying assumption of this project is that the backwater habitat we are enhancing is not currently a great habitat for these guys. In addition, we know that those off-channel habitats are not consistently connected to the main channel, which is one of the things that we will be addressing as well. So those areas aren't always accessible to salmonids. We've also been monitoring for uh, Omicus, which is the species that is uh, comprised of steelhead and rainbow trout. And uh, consistent with their biology, they tend to spawn a little later and rear a little later. So we had just begun to see these guys during our May surveys. Um, and at the time I'm recording this, we are just finished our June surveys yesterday. So it'll be interesting to see how that continues as well. We are also going to be conducting a rearing experiment at Long Bar. This is a really exciting um, experiment we have run at the Hallwood Project, which is a couple of years ahead of uh, Long Bar and also on the Yuba River. So that's where this photo is from. And the idea with this project is that we will actually release juvenile salmonids into the backwater habitats, both at the control and impact sites. Um, and we are going to tag those guys before we release them, and then when they begin to migrate downstream, they'll be funneled into these spike nets that span the width of the channel. So when we uh, collect them, we'll be able to measure a lot of things like growth and the, the amount of time that they've been spending in these habitats before they uh, begin to, to outmigrate. And we'll be able to collect uh, otoliths from a subset of them, which if you're unfamiliar with otoliths, it's a small sort of bony structure called an ear stone in the ear of the fish. And um, fish actually grow these ear bones very much like uh, trees grow. So they have these sort of rings that you can use to measure things like age and size and growth rates. So we're going to be collecting that data. Um, and to give you an idea of what we'll be able to get from that, this is some pre-project monitoring from the Hallwood um, study. And so you can see here that at our, our red site, um, which is our control in this in this project, we have a very quick drop off in the outmigration of salmon. So all of those guys seem to want to get out of that control site pretty quickly. But in contrast, uh, at our project site, both the wild salmon that were, were coming into our net as well as the tagged individuals we'd released were waiting longer before they outmigrated and seemed to be sort of coordinated in their patterns. So this is the kind of information that we're able to get, and then we would rerun this study, or we will rerun the study, after the Hallwood project's been constructed to compare how these patterns change. And we'll be doing the same thing at the Long Bar project um, beginning next year with our, our pre-project experiment. In addition to salmonids, we want to understand the productivity of these sites and the, um, the food resources and the energy that are available to the system and to the salmonids. So um, firstly, we're going to be looking at macroinvertebrates, which are the actual food resource for salmon. So these are little critters that live in the water. We're able to filter them out with these drift nets. And then we can identify the numbers and the types of species that are present. So for example, um, I don't expect you guys to be um, invertebrate experts. I'm certainly not. 
but we at Hallwood, we were seeing a lot of copepods and diptera. Um, and for the stomachs of the salmon that we were able to assess, we're seeing a lot of diptera in those guys' stomachs. So it seems like those are something they like to eat. Um, so this sampling will allow us to assess how those invertebrate communities change after the restoration project, and in particular, how that relates to the species that salmon are interested in eating, and hopefully we'll be increasing the number of food resources for them. We're also going to be looking at primary productivity, which is just the baseline amount of energy that is available to um, organisms in a system via things like algae that, that um, are able to feed off of sunlight and bring energy into the system in a form that's available. So to do this, we're going to be looking at algal growth along the substrate of the river. We can do this by collecting rocks that have algal growth and then scrubbing the algae off of those rocks into a known volume of water that we can then measure for chlorophyll as well as take um, subsamples of that water and filter them to get biomass samples. So that's what you see here. This is from some work on the Merced River that we've, we've um, done the same experiment. And you can see there's definitely, um, there's definitely sites where we get very little material, which suggests that those, those locations have low productivity. And then there's other sites where there's a lot of material, suggesting that those have a larger amount of energy that's available to that system. So we're hoping to increase the amount of energy that's available to salmonids and other organisms in those habitats we're constructing. In addition, we are interested in looking at um, vegetation, aquatic and terrestrial vegetation um, in the sort of riparian areas that are near these habitats because these uh, vegetation communities provide a lot of important benefits for aquatic systems. So um, this is a picture of the Longbar site now, and you can see that the, the ground there is very cobbly. It's not great habitat for plant growth, and there's not a lot of plant community that's currently, um, currently growing there. So we're going to be both actively planting as well as, as monitoring um, native or natural recruitment, excuse me, to see um, both if the general habitat conditions at this site change after construction when we're doing things like adding fine sediments um, and, and sort of cutting down that cobble substrate. But we're also going to be constructing some features into the habitat that we're hoping are going to enhance the, the sort of natural conditions that would form for vegetation. And in particular, we're going to be focusing on the, the growth and the recruitment of native species like elderberry. So CIRCLE is actually going to be leading this component of the monitoring, as well as the final monitoring component here, which is mercury monitoring. So if you are familiar with uh, work on the Yuba or just with the history of the Yuba, you uh, may very well be aware that there's a legacy of gold mining and mercury contamination in this system as a result. And so we want to be careful when we're working with sediments in this area to, to ensure that we are doing it in a way that's not releasing that mercury into the aquatic systems and, and potentially causing damage as a result. So CIRCLE is going to be leading some mercury monitoring of both the sediments we're working with as well as the aquatic environments before, during, and after construction to ensure that if we are seeing any issues, we're able to stop very quickly and reassess the situation. Um, so that we can perform that work in a way that doesn't release those, that mercury into the system. Okay, and finally, just before I wrap up here, I wanted to touch on the permitting that we have to do for this project. This is a giant table of all the permits that we have to complete um, with just a brief example of, or a brief explanation of what their purpose is and a status on where they are currently. So this is a lot. I'm just going to hit on a couple of highlights here. The first is that we are currently drafting a joint NEPA CEQA document, which allows federal and state agencies to assess the potential environmental effects of this project and make sure that we are um, providing benefits and, and not harm. So that is in, uh, in the process of being drafted. We also have a Section 106 application we have to submit, um, as well as doing AB 52 compliance, which is related to um, cultural resources and ensuring that the project isn't damning, damaging any um, human legacy that could potentially exist at the site. So that project or that application has been submitted um, and everything that we submitted in that application suggests that we are not in danger of harming anything at this project and we are waiting for um, agency response. 
So with that, I will just say that if you have any questions about additional permitting, please feel free to reach out um, or about monitoring as well, and I'm happy to answer them. But I will hand things back to my other team members. And now Sam at Seebeck Eco Engineering will talk a little bit about the project design. I'm Sam Diaz, a design engineer from Seebeck Eco Engineering. I'll now explain the basis of design for the proposed habitat enhancement effort. Silica Resources Incorporated, SRI, currently mines and sells fine aggregate from Longbar Mines lands. The project aims to work with Longbar Mine LLC and Silica Resources to remove a portion of the legacy hydraulic mining substrate on Longbar to enhance floodplain connectivity and habitat heterogeneity to create salmonid rearing habitat and promote riparian vegetation recruitment. Proposed project actions include grading approximately 40 acres on the 57-acre gravel and cobble bar. The restoration design includes features that benefit seasonal and perennial habitat for juvenile salmonid rearing to support U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Anadromous Fish Restoration Program doubling goals. Anadromous Pacific salmonids have evolved over millennia in diverse streams of Western North America. These streams were historically defined by a variable hydrograph, stream temperature, and habitat complexity, including primary and secondary channels and floodplains. These complex channel forms naturally segregated sediments and supported diverse riparian plant communities. This affected the amount and size range of sediment and woody material inputs to the channel which are key components of salmonid habitat quality. Anthropogenic activities have altered the riverine processes that create and maintain a diversity of habitats that support robust populations of anadromous Pacific salmonids. Within the Yuba gold fields, hydraulic and dredge mining activities resulted in a relatively simple river corridor with little riparian and floodplain habitat. Dams and the resulting stream regulation greatly reduces the variability of the diverse stream, not only in form, but also function, often simplifying the channel, hydrograph, and ecosystem and preventing migratory fish from accessing upper reaches, floodplains, and secondary channels that historically provided spawning and rearing habitat. Englebright Dam has contributed to reductions in habitat complexity and diversity by preventing the transport of sediment, woody material, and nutrients from upstream sources to the lower river. It has been hypothesized that low habitat complexity and diversity are limiting factors for salmonid production in the lower Yuba River, primarily through their effect on juvenile rearing success. Loss of off-channel habitats such as side channels, floodplains, riparian forests, and wetlands has substantially reduced the productive capacity of the Central Valley for many native fish and wildlife species, and evidence is growing that such habitats were once of major importance for the growth and survival of juvenile salmonids. Anadromous species such as Chinook, Salmon, and Steelhead hatch in freshwater and spend a portion of their lives rearing in the ocean before returning to freshwater to spawn. Chinook salmon typically spend from one to three years in the marine environment, and after spawning once, the adults die. Unlike Chinook salmon, steelhead can survive spawning, repeat the migration to the ocean, and return to freshwater to spawn more than once. While each salmonid species is unique, certain fundamental biological requirements are the basis for all management, recovery, or protection initiatives for salmonid streams. <clears throat> Chinook salmon can be divided into two life history strategies, stream or ocean type. Adult stream type Chinook salmon immigrate into natal streams from late winter to summer and hold in pools before making short migrations to spawning grounds in late summer and early fall. Their juveniles may spend a relatively long time, usually greater than one year, in freshwater before emigrating to the marine environment, requiring over summer rearing habitat. Within the lower Yuba River, spring-run Chinook salmon may have historically had a stream-type life history when they were able to migrate higher in the watershed. Available data shows that most lower Yuba River spring-run Chinook salmon emigrate to the ocean in their first spring at less than a year old. Fall-run Chinook salmon are an ocean type with adults 
typically spawning soon after entering fresh water, in early fall to early winter, and juveniles that spend a relatively short time, 3 to 12 months, rearing in fresh water. Within the lower Yuba River, steelhead tend to follow a stream-type life history with juveniles spending a year or more in fresh water before emigrating to the ocean. A portion of the population, especially some males, may not demonstrate an anadromous life history and remain within the natal stream for their entire life cycle. Juveniles tend to emerge from the gravels after incubation during the cool wet period of the California Mediterranean climate. Winter and early spring rearing habitat in the form of relatively shallow, slow-moving floodplains and secondary habitats such as side channels, alcoves, and backwaters provide refuge from cold, swift, turbid waters where less energy is spent fighting currents and clearer, warmer, and more productive waters increase feeding opportunities. Most fall-run Chinook salmon and some spring-run Chinook salmon and steelhead juveniles emigrate before the hot, dry season approaches. However, many steelhead and spring-run Chinook salmon remain in the lower Yuba River through the summer months, requiring relatively cool water with cover that provides flow refuge to conserve energy and visual protection from predators until the following winter. Within the lower Yuba River, Rearing habitat is considered a limiting factor for meeting Chinook salmon and steelhead production targets. The project will support the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Anadromous Fish Restoration Program doubling goal for fall run and spring run Chinook salmon and steelhead by increasing seasonal and perennial salmonid rearing habitat. Specifically, the project will restore and enhance ecosystem processes with a primary goal of augmenting and rehabilitating productive salmonid rearing habitat to increase natural production. To achieve this goal, the project objectives are to incorporate the project into an ecologically sound ecosystem context by designing the project to function under current water management constraints, that is timing, frequency, magnitude, and duration of elevated flows. Re-establish main channel and off-channel connectivity and complexity to restore ecological processes that increase availability and maintenance of off-channel rearing habitats. Create habitat conditions suitable for salmonid rearing, that is fry and sub smolts, in late winter and spring. As possible, Create habitat conditions suitable for over-summer rearing of spring-run Chinook salmon and steelhead. Create conditions suitable for natural riparian vegetation recruitment and survival, such as willows, Fremont cottonwood, and alders, among others. Do no harm to existing habitat features, particularly main channel spawning and incubation habitat. Habitat complexity will be increased by developing structures that function over a wide range of flows to allow juveniles to utilize the floodplain in various conditions. The project will develop areas to expand seasonal availability and provide rearing habitat during late winter and spring and also during summer. The project will include surface roughness features that promote fine sediment deposition and woody vegetation recruitment to provide shade, to cool the water in summer, and to provide cover and structural structural refugia. The project aims to significantly increase suitable rearing habitat acreage through the restoration of natural ecosystem processes associated with a well-connected, frequently inundated side channel and floodplain complex. Restoring the form and function of the channel and floodplain requires qualification and quantification of habitat available presently compared to what is proposed for the design shown here as a color ramp topographic map. Choosing a clear and precise definition of habitat for each life stage of each species allows us to use the criteria necessary to identify what is presently available and set goals to meet the vision of the restoration program given the prescribed flow regime for the system. To effectively rehabilitate and enhance juvenile Chinook salmon and steelhead rearing habitat within the lower Yuba River, this project was designed to function under current water management constraints. The following ecological 
considerations were of primary guidance in the design process. Determine species-specific life stage target periods. To support the goal of increased habitat complexity, create or enhance ephemeral juvenile salmonid rearing habitat that will inundate more frequently for up to three contiguous weeks annually during the winter-spring rearing season. This sustained inundation allows for warming and phytoplankton and macroinvertebrate colonization. Pulsed flows are important for moving nutrients through the system, but prolonged continuous inundation, or a high residence time of water, is thought to be critical for creating productive rearing conditions. Enhance summer low flow juvenile salmonid rearing habitat will, that will reduce metabolic needs and competition between members of the same species. Reduce potential non native fish predator holding, spawning, and rearing habitats. Design habitat enhancement that considers the variability of California's climate and the generational component of California salmonids. This includes the addition of seasonal rearing habitat that functions at the 1 to 2, 3 to 5, and 10 year recurrence intervals. This will support annual benefits, but also provide for precipitation variability expected during the three year life history that dominates California Chinook salmon. Site topography and bathymetry form the basis for hydraulic analysis and design. The topography of the project reach was surveyed using an unmanned aerial vehicle, a UAV, commonly known as a drone. Orthorectified images were collected using the UAV and a digital elevation model was prepared from them. Updated channel bathymetry was collected in a boat-based single beam sonar survey and added to the digital elevation model. Ground truthing for the UAV surface and additional topography and bathymetry data were collected using GPS survey equipment. The updated digital elevation model provided the basis for developing grading designs for hydraulic modeling and for comparing existing conditions to designed habitat features. The process for creating and refining the design was iterative and involved developing a design surface testing the design with a hydraulic model, evaluating the results, then continuing to refine and evaluate the design. A two-dimensional mesh was developed in a way that would allow the evaluation of current and proposed features. Hydraulic model simulations were conducted for a range of flows to assess suitable habitat for rearing juvenile salmonids that would occur. Quality habitat was assessed with the understanding that the habitat must activate at the appropriate time, allowing access, utilization, and egress for target species and life stages, function for a duration that provides benefit to the target organisms, function under the current regime of the river so that the habitat and benefits it provides are sustainable. By assessing the needs of the target species life stages, and the hydrology associated with those needs in current river management, we were able to analyze and tune the design to function as stated here to provide habitat benefits. The target species for the project are fall run Chinook salmon, spring run Chinook salmon, and steelhead. The project seeks to benefit the juvenile life stage of these species while doing no harm to existing spawning habitat. Under the California Mediterranean climate template, two seasonal salmonid rearing periods occur and represent the main ecologically significant periods analyzed. Winter-spring wet season, January to June. This is the main rearing period where juvenile salmonids require refuge from high flows, cold temperatures, turbidity, and relief from predators and competition. Summer-fall dry season, July to October. This is the oversummer rearing period where juvenile salmonids require relief from competition and predators. The target species spawn in the lower Yuba River from early fall through mid spring. Fall run and spring run Chinook salmon spawn during the base flow period from early September to late December. While not the primary focus of the project design, spawning was considered to ensure no habitat loss resulted from project implementation.
<clears throat> the design aims to provide continuous inundation duration in the range of 14 to 24 days, with a target of 21 days to promote food production, providing the opportunity for invertebrates, key salmonid prey items, to colonize off-channel areas. Studies on the Lower American River, a system analogous to the Lower Yuba River, have shown that floodplain invertebrate densities approach main channel densities after two to four weeks of inundation. Inundation frequency determines the likelihood that any year class will have the opportunity to utilize floodplain habitats. Central Valley Chinook salmon adults generally return to spawn at age three, with variations in each brood year. As such, the population may be continually supported by a benefit to juveniles that occurs as seldom as one in three years. Three frequencies were used to evaluate the effectiveness of the project design. The event for the specified duration during the specified rearing period occurring in one of every three years, every other year, and two out of three years on average. Based on our ecological flow evaluation, Design flows were developed to govern the development of habitat e enhancements. This table lists the various design flows along with their ecological importance and their significance related to physical processes. Flows related to 21-day inundation are shown in the yellow box. A species utility of habitat is determined according to habitat suitability indices. Habitat suitability for rearing juvenile salmonids and spawning adults was defined according to published habitat suitability indices for flow depth and velocity, represented as curves along which ideal habitat achieves a score of 1 and unsuitable habitat scores a 0. Habitat suitability index values for depth and velocity for, for juvenile Chinook salmon and steelhead were assumed to be the same and were developed by compiling observational data from multiple river systems, including the Lower Yuba River, Lower American River, Klamath River, Trinity River, and Sacramento River. Rearing juvenile salmonids prefer flow depths of 0 to 9 to 4 feet and flow velocities below 0 0.8 foot per second. Deeper or shallow, shallower water or faster flow velocities score less than one. Spawning habitat suitability indices were used to evaluate spawning conditions in the main channel and to make sure that the design does not impact main channel spawning habitat. The weighted usable area score is an indicator of habitat quality. The weighted usable area method applies a factor, a fraction roughly equivalent to a percentage, to each area to quantify the degree to which a species is predicted to utilize it. For example, one acre of weighted usable area could represent one acre of exceptional habitat with a habitat index score of one for ideal, or it could represent 10 acres of marginal habitat with a habitat index score of 0 0.1. Here you can see results for the 3,500 cubic feet per second flow in existing and design conditions with usable area created throughout the inundated design features in the lower frame. Larger amounts of habitat are provided at higher flows as more of the project area is inundated. Subsurface flow was important to characterize because it sustains riparian plants on bars and floodplain areas Additionally, to maintain appropriate water temperature to support over-summer salmonid rearing, some features are designed to convey groundwater input in late summer and fall when the channels are disconnected from surface flow. To determine the depth of groundwater at all graded areas in the design, we developed a map of elevation differences based on water surface elevations during base flow. This was used to evaluate availability of groundwater in the design condition. Riparian vegetation can benefit rearing salmonids both directly and indirectly. Direct benefits include cover from predation and high velocities, 
while indirect benefits include shading impacts on water temperature, phylloctonous nutrient and prey invertebrate contributions, and woody material inputs for cover and habitat complexity. These mechanisms have not been well tested for large Mediterranean climate streams similar to the lower Yuba River, but we are incorporating them for potential benefit. Floodplain grading was designed to support juvenile salmonid rearing and vegetation recruitment and establishment. Riparian plants are considered by the, constrained by the availability of soil moisture at their roots, and they are limited by exposure to high velocity flows. Soil moisture availability is influenced by substrate texture, a plant's distance from a flowing channel, and or relative elevation above groundwater. Fine sediment particle sizes help to slow drainage and increase soil moisture retention. They also increase pore pressure, which enhances capillary action that draws moisture up from a lower water table. The design creates a gradient of elevations, inundation frequencies, and groundwater depths and flood energy that are intended to generate a diverse mosaic of habitat types for juvenile salmonid rearing and riparian vegetation. We understand and expect that the river will change the design features over time. Our approach is to design the restoration in a manner that the site will be self-maintaining and functionally stable, sustainable in the long term. Understanding the range of flows and mobility of project features helps us to understand how they will function over time and influence the evolution of the site. Hydraulic model results were analyzed to assess movement of sediment and design features during a flood. A flow of 40,000 cubic feet per second corresponding to the five-year event generated the highest shear stresses across the project and was therefore used as the basis for assessing particle mobility. Channel and floodplain grading designs were based on site hydrology and geomorphic considerations, that is, evolution and persistence of design features. Hydrology was evaluated to determine ecologically sig significant flows that occur during the juvenile salmonid rearing period. The goal of floodplain and channel grading was to provide inundation throughout the range of ecological flows. This slide shows the various channel and floodplain types included in the design. Habitat elements were designed to initiate or begin to inundate at target flows to develop inundation depths and velocities that would satisfy the needs of juvenile salmonids over the rearing period. Now I will describe the various design elements and their intended function. The secondary channel, shown in blue, was designed to function optimally in flows ranging from 2,000 to 5,000 cubic feet per second that occur from January to June and last for 21 days in approximately two out of three years. <clears throat> the inlet is designed to divert water at 2,000 cubic feet per second so it won't affect spawning, which generally occurs at flows less than 1,000 cubic feet per second. The channel consists of riffles and pools at an elevation that should allow for groundwater-fed trickle flows in summer and fall when it is disconnected from surface flows at the inlet. The channel is designed to provide habitat to support extended juvenile rearing without providing favorable habitat for predatory and invasive species. The floodplain terraces of the secondary channel are designed to disperse flows out of the low flow channel, creating a broader refuge area with reduced velocity in flows above 2000 CFS cubic feet per second. These connect to larger riparian terrace features on the north and south sides of the secondary channel that help to spread water out on the bar, and I'll describe those in a moment. The backwater channel is an existing feature on the north side of Long Bar. We will enhance through opportunistic and strategic grading to develop perennial access to high quality edge habitat. To do this, we will remove existing higher elevation areas that currently divide the area into separate pools. We will preserve existing vegetation to maintain existing habitat value and grading will be designed to increase edge length and to bring the channel edges closer to overhanging vegetation. 
backwater channel functions optimally from 700 to 5,000 cubic feet per second flow from January to June with inundation lasting 21 days in two out of three years. It is anticipated that it will function best for juvenile rearing at the lower end of ecological flows from 2,000 to 5,000 cubic feet per second. However, it is designed to be perennially wet and function during base flow at 700 cubic feet per second. The upstream side channel, like the backwater channel, is an existing feature that will be enhanced to provide increased access to and egress from the floodplain. It includes a central channel and variable floodplain and bank line grading on either side. It's designed to connect to the main channel at 2,000 cubic feet per second flow. It is intended to function as rearing habitat from 2,000 to 10,000 cubic feet per second from January to June with inundation durations of 21 days and two out of three years. The flood runner channels are intended to mimic natural features that form on bars due to scour during elevated flows. The flood runners are designed to provide shallow water habitat within their banks and access to the larger open floodplain areas that surround them as flows increase. They're designed for optimal function from 3,500 to 10,000 cubic feet per second flows in January to June with inundation that lasts for 21 days. The flood runner channels will provide off-channel rearing habitat through regular and sustained shallow inundation of these channel features in most years. Perennial backwater channels were designed to create shallow slack water areas to provide habitat diversity and increased edge habitat during the rearing period as well as the low flow period to benefit oversummering juvenile spring run chinook salmon and steelhead. Backwater channel bed at elevations were, were set for shallow inundation less than one foot during main channel flows of 1,000 cubic feet per second and less. The backwater channels are designed to function from 700 to 5,000 cubic feet per second flows between January and June with inundation lasting 21 days and two out of three years. Riparian terraces are designed to function from 5,000 to 10,000 cubic feet per second in January to June with inundation lasting for 21 days and one out of every three to every other year. They are intended to disperse flows on the higher end of the ecological flow range associated with juvenile salmonid rearing to reduce velocity and provide expanded floodplain habitat. The connector channel portion of the riparian terrace is intended to divert water away from the backwater channel as main channel flows increase. thereby reducing depth and velocity in the backwater channel and extending its function as a refuge for rearing fish. Enhanced floodplain areas are intended to provide additional inundated acreage at the upper end of the targeted range of ecological flows from 5,000 to 10,000 cubic feet per second and to provide a depth to groundwater that will promote vegetation establishment and recruitment. They're designed to function from 5,000 to 26,000 cubic feet per second from January to June with inundation lasting up to three days in one out of three years. Main channel terraces were included in the design to provide a significant addition to available shallow edge habitat in the project area. The elevations of these large terraces were designed to maintain in-channel flows during the spawning season, but potentially activate during all other times of the year. The variation in elevation in the terraces was intended to promote utilization over the range of ecological flows associated with salmonid rearing. They are designed for optimal habitat in the range of 2,000 to 10,000 cubic feet per second from October to June, with inundation lasting for 21 days in two out of three years. Roughness features are inorganic roughness features um, added to the enhanced floodplain and main channel terraces 
to add hydraulic variability that will promote fine channel sediment accretion. These features will be oriented to form ridges perpendicular to flow to encourage sediment deposition on the downstream side. They will be constructed of locally available, well-graded, rounded rock stacked approximately two to six feet high. Areas of uplands will be preserved based on the value of existing vegetation to provide shade and habitat for other species adjacent to the graded project areas and to preserve valley elderberry, a species of concern. Thank you for watching. If you have comments, questions, or would like to provide feedback on the restoration project at Long Bar, please email us at yubarestorationproject at yubariver.org and somebody will be responding promptly. We will be soliciting and responding to comments and questions until Friday, July 31st, 2020. Thank you very much.